Things are like uh, we've we've done them like so much because we're presenting them to so many people that they're like, oh yeah, it's time for the the next podcast. <laughs> they're like, oh, this is good. You'll be able to record another uh, a new podcast. Nice. So you got to add that to your uh, for your next performance review. <laughs> Podcast. podcast ambassador of Ford Design. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So then, is this is this on YouTube too? Because people, are, my my friend was asking, one of my coworkers was asking to, for a link to watch. Yeah, yeah, I can send you a link. We are just as a heads up to everybody, we are live right now on YouTube. So awesome! Uh, Welcome everyone. Mm-hmm. So then is this is this on YouTube too? Because people are my my friend was asking one of my coworkers was asking to, for a link to Yeah, it is on YouTube as well. Um let's see if we can get you a link. Sorry, that was uh that was the actual YouTube <laughs> playing back. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh we're in a, thing, right? <laughs> I'm continuum there. We're in a loop. <laughs> That happened to me last week. (laughs) You kept answering the same question? Let's see. That is the YouTube link. Awesome. So in about one minute, um, we're going to go live on Zoom and we can get rolling. Sounds good. All right, we're good to go. Hector, you are muted. Hello, students out there that are just joining us right now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and keep the room open here for a minute just to get everybody in. Welcome to our event. I just want to draw your attention really quickly Right here to the bottom of your screen, you're going to see the chat button. Just make sure you click on that chat button there and then adjust the chat 
to all panelists and attendees. This way we can see all of your questions, your comments and interact with you here. Uh, we will be taking questions. We will be interacting with you today. We just wanna make sure that everybody's questions can be seen here. So let us know where you're from there in the chat, please. For those of you just joining us, we also wanna make sure that you know that everybody will receive a copy of this event sent to you as a recording. So a link will go to the email that you use to register for this event. Uh, so uh, let's let us know where you're from here in the chat while we're waiting for everybody to show up here. All right, thanks for joining us in Canada there, Mitra. All right, we have Utah here, Louisiana. Hello, and San Ramon, Sydney and Reno, Cyprus, Palo Alto, Richmond, Washington. Joel from India, thanks for being here, bud. Portland, Oregon. Antonio Allison from Los Angeles. Yeah. In the house. <laughs> we have some LA natives in the house here tonight. Shelby in Arizona's here. Aaron, they all came out for you, bud. A lot of people from all over, it's awesome. Yeah, go Dodgers in the chat. There we go. We <laughs> a split fan base tonight, I'm sure. Charlie from Reno, Isabel from Ohio, New Jersey. All right here. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm just going to read it one more time. If you haven't found your way to the chat button, just make sure you click on that chat button and adjust to all panelists and attendees. This way we can see all of your chats here. So, uh, just make sure that you pay attention to that. So before we get started tonight, I just wanted to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions at Academy of Art University here in San Francisco, California, USA. So I know we have people that are here internationally as well. So thank you so much, whatever time zone you're in, for taking the time to spend the night with us here. So it should be a fun night. Tonight's event is Bronco Designing a Legend with the star of our show, Aaron Gould. We also have Antonio Borja here. He's the director of the School of Industrial Design. He's going to be joining us as well. Uh, before I do introductions, I just want to make sure that I take a quick second to promote a couple of events. So in the chat, I'm going to drop a link here. If anybody here is interested, we do these events every single Tuesday night. Next week is going to be Art History Professional Preparedness Workshop. Uh, this is going to be really cool on art history. So feel free to check us out in RSVP there if you'd like to join. I'm also going to put the link to our events page. We have so many different events going on. We usually do two or three a week. Every Tuesday, same time, same place, we do a different topic here. So this has always been a really cool place to hang out on your Tuesday night and learn some skills, see some demos, things of that nature. But please find your way to that event page if you want to check out some of the future events. Uh, one note on that event page is the month is ending. So just click on the button that takes you over to November and you'll see the whole November schedule. You're only gonna see one thing on that October schedule because this is the last event we're doing in the calendar month. So click over to November and you'll see the whole page there before it flips over. So without further ado, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it over here to Antonio Borja. He is the director of the School of Industrial Design. He's gonna be joining us tonight and he'll be in the chat with me. Uh, but before we uh, introduce Aaron, I want to go ahead and let Antonio say hello to everybody. Thank you, Hector. Um, I just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you guys for taking the time to come out today and watch one of our talented alumni, Aaron Gould. Uh, Aaron was actually one of my first uh, students when I started teaching at the academy. Um, so it's been great to kind of see him go full circle from, uh, from being a design student to graduating and uh, joining the, the Ford design team and now launching products. So it's, uh, for me, it's been a pleasure. It's kind of been an honor watching Aaron from afar uh, develop through his career. So I'm really excited to, uh, to have him here tonight and to be able to, you know, have him share his experience with all of you young creatives out there that uh, may be looking at industrial design as a potential field where um, you can make your mark on the world. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. I'll take, take it away, Hector. All right, perfect. So yeah, once again, my name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions. My job tonight is gonna to be to help host. I'm gonna be in the chat with Antonio for questions. We wanna make sure to get as many questions as possible and interact with you. Gonna have a really cool presentation and some live demo as well with Aaron tonight. So uh, we're just here to help. We're here to answer questions and try to connect with you. So anybody interested in looking at the school after the event, I'll be giving you my email and all the information so we can at least set up a time to talk. So without further ado, let me introduce Aaron Gould. He's a, an alumni here from Academy of Art University from 2015. He's an interior 
designer in the global strategic design studio at Ford Motor Company. During his five years at Ford, he has worked on many interior projects, including designing the interior of the new 2021 Bronco Sport. Super cool car. If you haven't seen it, you're definitely going to get some cool, uh, some cool photos of it tonight. Uh, in his current role, he's a part of the interdisciplinary team of designers, researchers, thinkers, and developers focused on the future. His team is involved in strategic projects focusing on reimagining the relationship between the human and the vehicle. He is passionate about human-centered design and creating objects that resonate with people. So I'm going to hand it over here to the star of the show, Mr. Aaron, tonight, and I'll see you all in the chat. Thank you all. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for the intro. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, pretty excited. Uh, let me go ahead and I will uh, bring up my screen. So yeah, as you said, um, I am a uh, automotive designer um, for Ford Motor Company. I've been there about um, five years. And let me just figure out how to share my screen. There we go. All right, hopefully everyone sees it. Um, so yeah, just a little bit uh, about myself. I um, currently live in Detroit, Michigan. I work in um, the Global Strategic Design Studio at Ford Motor Company. Uh, I've been here about five years. Um, like Antonio said, I, uh, I graduated from AAU in 2015, um, and I was lucky enough to um, end up at Ford Design, uh, where I've had a really great time uh, so far, learned a ton, um, really got to apply a lot of the lessons um, learned while at school, um, you know, really enjoyed my time there. And so I guess to start off, I'll just go a little bit about uh, my background. Um, so I'm a designer. Um, so really what I'm passionate about is creating objects. And, you know, really throughout my time, when I look at, you know, what I do as a designer, it's really, you know, I become obsessed with human behaviors and um, kind of how people interact with um, you know, the products they use, the things that they do every day, and how this affects their relationship with things around them. Um, a big part of um, what we like to do, especially as a, you know, as my team at Ford is we want to bring joy to people um, in their everyday life. Like, you know, a lot of things um, are special to people. And it's something that we want to make sure we're, you know, putting joyful moments inside of, you know, each and every part of their day. Um, and so I graduated again from uh, AAU in 2015. My degree was in transportation designer. Um, been at Ford Motor Company since 2015 as an interior designer. My dog's name is Hank. This is the most important part uh, so far, probably. Um, I grew up in Billings, Montana, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, moved to San Francisco. Um, pretty much made the decision to move to San Francisco uh, a week before classes started. Um, uh, the first semester after dropping out of film school uh, in Montana the previous year. Uh, so, you know, I took a, a big leap and no one really believed me when I, when I said, not that they didn't believe in me, but they didn't believe me when I told them I was moving. Uh, they, <laughs> they didn't realize until they, I didn't show up to uh, stuff the next week. They're like, oh, you actually left. Um, you know, I'd never seen the school, just kind of jumped off, uh, you know, with my eyes closed with both feet, um, just, you know, a big dream. And, a really obsessive uh, personality. Um, a big thing that people tell you when uh, when you start down this road is that you're never going to get a job. You know, you you have to be really really good. There's no jobs out there. Um, a lot of people don't even know that it's a job in the first place. Um, and so, you know, it it school's hard. It takes a lot of work to graduate. Um, but you know, if, as long as you love what you do, that doesn't matter. You know, it, just stay focused on what you know your task at hand is you know, prioritize what's important and really just start to get after it. Um, you know, the big thing that people struggle with, I think it causes a lot of um, people to kind of give up is that in the beginning, you know, you're not good, <laughs> you're bad. And that's something you have to realize is okay. Um, it's frustrating and um, you, you get frustrated because you can't uh, make the things that you think you're capable of. Um, but you have to remember that that's okay. Um, you can be bad for a while just as long as you're getting better. Um, and the only way you can stop being bad is uh, just do more, produce more, sketch more, uh, you know, make more things, think of more things. You know, the more you do this, the sooner you stop being bad. And, you know, as soon as you stop being bad, you can start to become good. 
Um, and the thing to remember though is good enough doesn't exist. So no matter how good you are, there's always someone better, there's always someone working harder um, and it's a very competitive field. Um, and so you always have to be open to every opportunity that presents itself. Um, so try as hard as you can to get you know, internships because this is where you're really gonna learn the most. Um, as much as school can prepare you, it really can't prepare you as much as you know, getting hands-on um, in the field. And that was something that, you know, through Antonio in the relationship with the school, we had a lot of opportunities to do. Um, they have a ton of um, industry placements and connections with, um, you know, design studios in um, and around the Bay Area and around the world. Um, so that's just an amazing resource that, um, you know, Antonio and the other, um, you know, people in the industrial design program really offer. That's something that I think is really special to the academy is, you know, the relationship you get to have with not only your professors, but, you know, people that are professionals and coming in, um, you know, after their day job and teaching classes, giving critiques, you know, meeting with the students is something that was really valuable because um, they know that, you know, what actually teaches people is the real world. Um, and just remember that, like, you know, be really humble, learn from everyone you can, um, you know, if you're lucky, people are going to teach you things and, you know, your, your job after being taught things is to show people that it's worth their time, that you're picking up on what they're telling you. Um, and that, you know, just remember you're generally being hired, you know, for your, your potential, you have more to learn in the beginning uh, than you have to offer. And that's something that I always, you know, think now it's still true, no matter how much further you, you get in your career, like I'm learning new stuff every day. Um, and I always feel like I'm a little bit, uh, you know, out of my depth, but I just try to learn, be humble and try to, you know, get information as much as I can. So the high points, you know, is make great portfolios, do great work, and, you know, even more importantly, develop great relationships. Um, so I was lucky enough to um, be offered an internship with Ford Motor Company in the summer of 2013. And I got to go intern in um, the Irvine uh, studio, where I got to meet some really amazing people and feel like uh, I had no business uh, being in that building with those people because they were at such a, you know, their talent level was so much above mine, um, but they were so kind and really patient with me and um, you know, really taught me so much and uh, really gave me the opportunities to expand my skills, get to know what it would be like uh, to see, you know, is this an industry I wanna be in? I was always torn between um, the idea of doing product design and doing um, automotive design, just because there's a little bit of a separation there in skill set, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's the same job and it's, you know, it's all about, you know, what you're going to be the most happy with and you have to be honest with yourself. Um, so it's just as much as about you figuring out the right fit for yourself as it is, you know, wanting to get the job. Um, that's something important because, you know, you have to be happy with yourself um, in your work um, and this has to be something you're passionate about. Um, so moving on to kind of my first uh, production project, my first project with Ford, uh, when I started five years ago, uh, seems so long ago now. Um, you know, like I said, I got to join after my internship. I was lucky enough after I graduated to be um, invited back to come work with them full time in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And, you know, I got to join this, this really amazing team. And all, <laughs> literally all I can do is try to keep up, uh, which is still true today. Um, I'm surrounded by a peer group that's, um, you know, inspiring and challenging every day. And I was lucky enough to, um, to have my design chosen for the production vehicle, which, um, you know, not only is it difficult to um, get a job in this industry and get a degree in this industry, but it's even more of a, you know, a special opportunity to be involved in a production program, um, especially one that has as much, um, you know, history and, um, you know, background as something like the Broncos. So that was a really special experience. And um, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today for the first part of the um, kind of process uh, process section. Um, so, you know, starting out with these um, projects, it's always really important is to, to start with the user. So we're not just drawing shapes. We're not just, you know, making pretty pictures. We're really, you know, we're looking at human behavior. We're looking at what people um, do. So when we knew this vehicle was built for, you know, 
people who go on adventures. Um, the Bronco Sport was segmented a little bit differently because it's not necessarily the car people use to, you know, climb, drive to the top of the mountain or go and, you know, rock crawling. Um, but they need to be so, needs to be something that gets them to the foot of the mountain. You know, the trailhead, the mountain bike uh, trail, the surf spot. It needs to be capable. It needs to get all their gear. So, um, as we were designing this this project, we were like, okay, like what's the gear that people have? Like, we started drawing it into our sketches, um, not just the people. You know, what do they have with them? What do they bring with them? Um, and trying to think about, okay, like these people, you know, are outgoing, they're adventurous, um, you know, it's really important to put yourself in the shoes of, of the person you're designing for, because that's what really um, makes the difference at the end of the day. Like, it's something that as a company, you can rally around. Um, it's something as a designer, you can kind of take, um, take stake in and really feel like you're making a meaningful contribution um, to the world, which is something that's really important And it. You know, it sounds kind of maybe overblown, but, you know, I think it's important that we don't realize how much um, effect products have on our daily lives um, and how much joy uh, it can bring to people to have a good experience versus a bad experience with a product. And sometimes it's something that you don't even realize um, consciously, but as designers, it's up to us to be able to know things, um, know, you know, know people's behavior almost better than them um, and really create, create objects that, you know, enhance their lives and they enhance joy. Um, you know, if you can take um, something as simple as a toaster and, um, and make the experience that much better for someone, then, you know, even without them realizing it, you've, you've improved their day and you've set up their day for so much better um, going forward. And, you know, that's something that we kind of try to remember when we're building products, um, you know, build the architecture around the people. So this was one of the initial um, theme sketches for the, um, the Bronco Sport IP. Um, and as you can see, it's um, this idea of, you know, simple forms uh, that are cut and shaved out around um, where the driver would be, because this is a very, this was when we were starting off, we knew this was a, you know, a driver focused vehicle that these people are, you know, they're obsessed with the next um, mountain to climb, the next, you know, hike, the next surf spot, the next PR, um, you know, they want to know that they're capable of, of doing these things. And they really saw, um, you know, their vehicle as a place to recharge, reset, um, feel like they were, um, you know, safe from the elements, you know, safe for their next spot for adventure. Um, and so we really wanted to, you know, make these simple forms, simple gestures, um, but then insert, you know, small technical bits where it would make the most difference. So as you see this like main overall, um, you know, interior that's overall is pretty simple. And then around the driver, it just has these inserted bits where they'll make the most difference. So the air vents, the cluster, you know, the speedometer, the um, door handles, they're kind of, you know, used in, a, they're put in a different color so that people can see like very easily where to reach for things, where they can get their, you know, the air vent to make themselves more comfortable, um, where to adjust the volume on the radio, where to see their speed, you know, all the important stuff. So we're emphasizing, you know, the things that need to be emphasized and giving these people, you know, a little bit more room to focus on what really matters to them, which is, you know, the nature they're surrounded by, um, where they're going, how to get to the next trail. Um, and again, you know, as we move forward with more of the, you know, getting closer to the, the final product, it's really important to think about, you know, the entire vehicle. So, you know, what are they going to put there? You know, are they going to hang stuff on the tailgate when, you know, they're done uh, after a rainy bike ride? You know, they've had backpacks in the front. Do they put a net on the roof? Um, we actually went out and looked at people's cars, like in the parking lots and said, wow, like these, these cars are basically like, you know, locker rooms for people at a certain extent. So, you know, we need to make it feel like, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're not misorganized because it doesn't look like someplace you want to be. So if we can make things, uh, you know, feel a little bit more organized, you know, even through the chaos of their lives, then that's something that's really going to make a difference for them. Um, and then, you know, put your drawing, put your, put your design in context is another big thing. So thinking about what, you know, your user means, like, what does it, what does it feel like to get off of like a, you know, long trail run in the rain or in the snow and come back and know your vehicle is warm and dry and just ready for you to, you know, clean up and move on to the next part of your day. Um, so it's really important to create context around uh, what you're creating. And then the other important thing is to work in real life as much as possible. So, 
you know, in the automotive industry, we build a lot of clay models. Um, lately, we've been doing a lot of stuff with um, like white foam because uh, it's a lot more, um, you know, it's a lot quicker to use, quicker to uh, modify. And you can see, um, you know, your spaces you're creating in real life. And I think that's something that's super important because, you know, even me, you know, as a designer, I get kind of locked in um, to the screen quite a bit. And we start to forget like, okay, we, we actually have to see what this is like in real life. You know, what does it feel like to touch? What does it feel like to sit in this? You know, am I putting the, um, the objects in the right distance from a person? You know, is it easy to see things? Can I see um, out of it? Am I comfortable? You know, just remember models don't lie. So you can, you can lie and you can, uh, you can, you know, do the voodoo in your, uh, your CAD and your, um, your Photoshop's all you want, but once you get into the real model, everything becomes really apparent and you can no longer cheat, which is something that's, you know, really beneficial. And the other thing, I mean, you know, we, we get into these like philosophical discussions about who we are as designers, but, you know, at the end of the day, a big part of what we do is, you know, we want to create beautiful imagery um, for people to see and people to relate to. So it's also remembered, to don't, don't, you know, don't forget to have fun and, and sketch and, you know, really challenge yourself with new um, techniques and processes. Um, you know, I'm always looking for new ways to sketch, new, you know, color palettes, new techniques, um, everything I can to kind of use um, to get better as a person and to keep myself, you know, motivated and interested to keep, you know, trying new things. Um, I think that's a big part of everything. Like, I think, you know, it's easy to go through, um, through college or through school or whatever, you know, so anything you're trying to learn and, you know, it's, you can skate by with the bare minimum and, you know, there's a lot of people that, that do that, but, you know, it all depends on what you want uh, for yourself out of, you know, out of your career, out of your, your life. And, you know, you get back what you put into it. Um, you know, I've had lots of sleepless nights. I remember um, at the warehouse at the, you know, the, at the Academy of Art where, uh, you know, they had to kick us out of the building um, because we were working on our models and, you know, it was, we'd been on no sleep, but, you know, it didn't matter because we loved what we were doing and it was, um, it was a process of love and something that you really can't, you know, it's nothing you can force yourself to do. It's something that you have to be, you know, driven to do and something that you have to love um, because it's so, you know, competitive and it's so uh, draining and it's so difficult that it's something that you really need to know that you want to be a part of. Um, and that's something that really spoke to me when I first started um, at the academy was, you know, the kind of the warnings from a lot of professors telling me, you know, how difficult it was going to be, how competitive it is. And, you know, I just use that as a, you know, a driving uh, motivation. I think, you know, a lot of people started with one idea of what we, they thought this was and found out it wasn't for them and they found, you know, something else that they, they liked and that's great. Um, and that's something that you got to do for yourself and you got to figure out, you know, the right path um, for yourself. And for me, luckily I, I found this, I don't know <laughs> what I would be doing if I, if I wasn't drawing cars for a living, because I don't know if I'm uh, good at much else, but it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and super lucky to be, be doing. Um, I have to pinch myself every day that this is what I get to do. Um, so, you know, if that's, that's kind of where, you know, that project um, is ending now, it's, it's a production car. You can, I'm not gonna, um, you know, go too much more into that. You can see it online. There's hundreds of YouTube videos that are gonna explain it uh, way better than I can and show you the ins and outs of the interior. So I kind of want to leave a little bit to, um, to you guys to kind of explore on your own. Uh, but I'm gonna get into kind of um, kind of the next chapter of, of my career at Ford um, and kind of show like, you know, where currently what we're doing and what we're doing to, to kind of push process and you know, keep innovating um, as a studio to see like how we can push, um, you know, smart vehicles to the next uh, generation. And that's a big strategic goal with the company is to make sure that we're, we're not just creating vehicles for today, uh, even though we're, you know, we have a lot of really successful products. You know, as a company, we're, we're all about challenging ourselves and making sure that, you know, we're pushing towards the next thing. You know, we'll see with new powertrains, um, you know, autonomous vehicles, um, all these things that we're, we're pushing as a company. And it's something that's really cool to be a part of. Um, so my current role is um, I'm a designer in the Global Strategic Design Studio. Um, Ford is, 
something that I've really loved being a part of is uh, being able to embrace this human centered design process, which is uh, what I talked about earlier. Um, these are some sketches that um, one of my colleagues near Siegel did look him up on Instagram. He's a, he's a rock star uh, of some people that we met at these research events and he just does these sketches and it really captures like um, what the people are feeling like when we're talking to them, cause we're showing them something new or we're asking them questions about their lives. And it's just something that's really beautiful that you know we can do um, as a team to kind of seek new insights and new information about you know what people are doing in their real lives and you know what we might be able to do for them in the future. So a little bit about how we work. These are things that we're doing um, to make ourselves better human-centered designers. And um, this is this is a kind of a little section from a piece that uh, my boss did at Awards Automotive Conference a couple of years ago. So. If anyone's interested, definitely check that out. It was a, it was a really cool article. Um, so what we do is we look for clues everywhere. So we use real customers for inspiration. So we don't just sit behind our desks and think about what a customer might want or need. Um, we go out and we, we look at them, we watch them, um, kind of spy on them, if you will, uh, and see, you know, what they're doing. So we're saying like, okay, like, you know, it's a, teachable moments. So it's not just a kid, um, you know, and a dad loading something in the back of a truck. You know, this is a meaningful moment for these people. Um, we try it out ourselves. So we get out from our desks and we immerse ourselves to really understand what's going on. Uh, there's a few more of my teammates um, who are, um, you know, exploring a transit when we're looking at like, you know, what does this space feel like? What can we do with this? You know, how is a customer actually going to interact with this? And we play, so it's really important to know that our studio is not, you know, it's not a, a museum, it's not a design museum that you're not allowed to touch anything, you know, keep your hands to yourself. No, it's a playground. We want to be able to camp out and uh, evolve the designs and really explore things um, and show, you know, how um, we're being creative with customers. Um, so we share and listen. So we, we don't do, you know, we don't talk one way with the customer. We don't just show them things. We look, you know, in real life, like what people are using. And then uh, when we get back to the studio, we say, okay, what did that mean? Like, what were we, what were we doing? What do we see here? And we kind of dissect it and try to create fun things. Um, and the biggest thing that we're pushing um, as a team is systems thinking. So I think beyond just a standalone product, um, we have to balance all this for a consistent system um, and a unique user. So we're thinking more about, you know, the entire product lineup instead of just, you know, um, single products. And so that's it for the uh, kind of spiel portion. I think um, if we want to open up for any questions or anything like that, and maybe start the discussion and then uh, Antonio just kind of let me know uh, what we should do now. Yeah, no. Um, so we actually do have a few questions that have come up. Um, one of them is, um, did you use the scientific or engineering methods, math, physics, et cetera, in your work? Or is it purely art? That's a question from one of the um, attendees. That's a good question. So lucky for me, I work with a bunch of really, really smart people that are good at math and, and science. Um, those were not my fortes uh, in school. Um, so luckily Ford has some really amazing engineers and, uh, and scientists and that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the most um, important things is you know, collaborating with, you know, other disciplines and seeing like, you know, you know, what, what in your like world can be, you know, can cross cross pollinate and count, you know, how can I help you? How can you help me? Um, so, but personally, no, I, I don't know much math. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of times that's the, the thing that um, we have to root remind people that maybe don't understand the field or just aren't aware of the field is that it is a bridge though between, you know, the engineering team and, you know, being able to, to provide a vision for what the future can be. Um, right. And so, you know, it, it was, to me, it was really interesting seeing the, the, the second part of your presentation as well. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, you're going out there and you have a constant feedback loop, you know, a lot of times in the design process, we, we tend to go through a few feedback loop, uh, you know, a few cycles, but, you know, it sounds like you guys are in a constant feedback loop, which is 
great for the studio because it keeps you guys engaged and it keeps you innovating much faster than, you know, just going through it one cycle and then, and then not coming back to it again uh, until much later when you're on, an, on the next project. So um, that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty awesome to see. Yeah, that's something super important to us. Like we noticed that, you know, we, you know, you can't, you can't go to a customer too many times. Like you can't, you can't stop learning. Um, you know, you have all these assumptions and that's, I think, a uh, important thing to have as a, a designer is, you know, opinions and kind of like instincts and gut feelings. Um, and, you know, just testing them in real life is really what proves them out so that you don't waste time, um, you know, do, doing things that, you know, aren't going to, you know, benefit you uh, yeah. in the long run. So I think that's, yeah, that's super important. So we have another few questions here um, that I'm, I'm going to address. Uh, so um, what did what did you do to get into designing cars? Um, did you just draw cars or did you draw other things? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as a, as a kid growing up in school, elementary school, the classic um, designer story is, you know, you always got in trouble for drawing cars in the margins of your notebook or in your assignment. Um, and I definitely am, you know, guilty of that cliche for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wish, always grew up wishing I could draw cars uh, better than I could. Um, and it's something that I really, you know, you don't even necessarily know um, that it's a job. Uh, yeah. and, you know, I grew up not really, you know, wanting to be like, you know, I remember telling my mom at a young age, like, then I wish I could just be the guy, like, I think I was in elementary school, but like, I wish I could be the guy that just came up with ideas at companies and like did that. And I was like, you know, I thought that'd be so cool. And then little did I know, like, that's an actual job you could do. <laughs> uh, and so, so actually when I was in, um, I started out going to film school. I thought I'd wanted to make movies, uh, which didn't pan out luckily. Um, and one of a guy who was my neighbor in the dorms, he was actually an architecture student. Um, and he always, he was always drawing and I thought it was so cool. And I asked him like, you know, he saw me drawing like little doodles and stuff. He's like, oh, you should, you should do something in, in the design world. Uh, and I was like, oh, is there a job where you like design cars? He's like, oh yeah, there is. And he told me about it. He's, you know, yeah, it's called transportation design or product design. And so I spent the night Googling and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> That's and awesome. then uh, I ended up not going back to school after that semester and kind of spent the summer at home uh, in, in Montana just working kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, and then I somehow Googled um, car design schools or something. And, uh, you know, Academy of Art came up. And, you know, the cool thing actually was, um, like, there was no, like, portfolio, portfolio requirement um, at the Academy of Art, which I thought was, was cool because a lot of the other schools, um, really, um, you know, they require a lot of portfolios before you start even trying to learn how to draw. And uh, so I, <laughs> I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to be able to get into any of those schools um, because I didn't have any sort of portfolio. I never really did art in college or anything. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how that went. And then um, I talked to one of the admissions people um, at the Academy of Art and they, you know, told me what was going on. And I just ended up heading out there, um, just kind of jumping in. And then that's where I met Antonio and uh, a bunch of other great instructors. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so we have another question here too. Um, so as a car designer, do you get to travel, um, travel the world and go to different shows as well? What are some of the perks of being a car designer? Yeah, I mean, I get to travel a little bit. Um, I got to go to Austin, Texas for a research event. Um, not super glamorous, but a lot of our team goes back and forth um, with China. Um, they go to Shanghai quite a bit for research. We have studios in um, Australia. We have studios in um, studios in uh, Germany, in London, in um, I think in Turkey now. There's a design studio. So there's a lot of a lot of studios around the world. Um, Personally, I haven't I haven't traveled that much. A lot of my projects have been, um, you know, North American focused. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of travel, but especially now with COVID, everything's kind of shut down. But you know, there is a lot of opportunity. I know other companies do um, 
uh, uh, quite a bit of travel too for auto shows and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity for that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, another question here is, uh, where did you meet some of the people you consider instrumental networks that helped you that help you open doors for you professionally? Yeah, I mean, a big one is uh, the guy on the other end of the screen is Antonio. He's um, he's amazing. He's like, uh, you know, the the matchmaker. He's, he's all right. Great. All right. You, I guess the check cleared, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, yeah. Who are some of the other people? I mean, obviously in school, you know, you, there's there's some, but I mean, you also made it a point to network with people, and you know, as you went out to these internships. Yeah, there's There's also other people that you met, you know, and and so if you can tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so I mean, I got to, um, I got to know people at my internship. So one thing I learned really quickly is that if you if you show people that you're interested in learning what they have to offer, they're going to be a lot more interested in um, in teaching you things. And one thing I made sure when I saw people in the studio um, that I really admired, I would always go up and ask them like, hey man, you know, I'm, I would introduce myself and I would just say, hey, like, you know, I really love what you're doing. Like if there's anything that I can help you with, or like, if you ever need help, just let me know. And that ended up uh, being, you know, at one of my first, in my first internship, um, I got to go work in the, um, the Samsung uh, design studio in, um, in San Francisco yeah. with um, a bunch of people that were really talented. And I ended up, you know, just being, I just wanted to be available at all times, just like any other jobs, like, you know, always be looking for, for stuff you can do. Um, and uh, that ended up just being, you know, me making foam core models um, of like vacuum cleaners for like three weeks, just, you know, day and night, just making as many um, as I could. And so I met a few guys named uh, Joseph, who uh, I don't know where he's at now. I should, I should reach out to him. And Joseph Choi? Joseph Choi, yeah. I think he yeah. taught in the academy for a while, right? No, he's still teaching. He's, he is. Uh, tell him I say hi. I miss, I miss him. He's our uh, guru in Design Drawing 3, where he's still... Yeah, he's, he's still uh, holding down the fort, uh, teaching both the product design and transportation design. As you know, he's a very, very talented designer. And, and yeah. you know, I call him like the unicorn of our field because he's done both. He, he's designed yeah. cars and then he's also done some great products, um, you know, uh, at General Motors and then also, you know, great products at Samsung and currently at Romeo Power. So, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's great. He would uh, he would. Uh, um I would I would stay late and I would like try to show him my car sketches and he'd be like what the hell are you doing and he would he would correct them he'd draw over them and then I'd try better the next day and you know he kept he kept coming back he he was great um, so I think that's a big part of it it's just meeting people that you know, are good and, and you know at, at Ford when I was there you know I was super lucky to get the opportunity um, and I got to meet um, a lot of designers there um, uh, luckily there was there was a big meeting. Um, where I, I got to show, you know, some of the people from the team that I wasn't necessarily working on um, some of my work and they just saw it up in the studio. And so um, they were about to kind of, you know, when, when, uh, when I graduated, when my name came around, I think they kind of put a, were a little bit more familiar with my work. So I think that gave me a little bit of a, um, an opportunity to kind of stand out a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, that was, a, that was just, you know, I've been lucky, I've been extremely lucky. Um, no, that's awesome. But I mean, it's, you know, I, I think it goes back to the old saying, it's not really, it's not really who you know, it's who knows you. So if totally. you don't work, if you do good work, you're good people, you're good to people, and you're genuine, because, you know, you want to show people who you really are, because, you know, they're going to pick you for certain rules for who you are. So you don't want to, you know, present something that you really isn't genuine to you as a person, and then you don't feel happy, because, you get put in a role that really isn't a good fit for you. So, you know, yep. I think those are some things that we can share with young designers and young creatives that, you know, definitely be genuine, you know, on who you are and, and understand that, you know, companies are looking for students and, and creatives with different perspectives, you know, we're, we're not, you know, you don't, there's not a mold that you have to fit in order to, to become a designer. And I think that's, that's one thing that uh, I think it's a challenge for a lot of students to understand that. So, you speaking on that has been has been really great. Um, and so, 
Yep. Oh, I was going to say one of the questions I saw for Aaron earlier was they were talking about the timeline of that project. Like how long does a project like that last? What's the timeline look like on, on maybe where you started to where you kind of finished on that project? Yeah. So, so for the Broncos sport, um, that was quite a long time. I think it was like, like a average production car takes, you know, I think the industry average is like something like three years um, from start to finish. Um, and with, you know, the newest Bronco, I think they, they actually pushed it a lot quicker than that. Um, we're always trying to get faster. Um, I think some of the other the industry best, you can probably, you can probably look it up. I'm sure this is all public knowledge. Um, is that we're always trying to lower that time um, as fast as we can so that we can get the most like, uh, you know, relevant product on the market as possible. Um, but yeah, it really varies in, in the project. Um, cause some, some projects are based on, you know, existing platforms and they're, you know, there's just a little bit of work to do. Some are, you know, completely new platforms, which take, you know, um, a lot longer to develop, uh, obviously, but, um, yeah, it, it really varies. There's no, there's no set timeline, but we're always, we're always trying to get faster. They're always trying to make me sketch faster and, you know, <laughs> work more hours, which is, which is great. I, I love it. So. So um, if, if we can, I think this would be a good, good point to, to move on to the second uh, portion of the presentation where uh, we can start doing a sketch demo. And then maybe as you're sketching, um, there's a few more questions here that uh, yeah, keep, you know, we'll, we'll have you address as you're, uh, as you're showing us you know, your process. And, uh, and you know, it just, we'll keep it casual. Um, for the attendees, I, I ask you to please continue to you know, ask any questions. Uh, we'll try to interject where appropriate and, and, and ask Aaron um, you know, the questions that are coming in. So, but uh, I do wanna get to this next part of it because you know, we're, I think we're all really excited to, to kind of learn from your process. And, and this is one of the things that you know, I would encourage young designers, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily looking at how different people do things to just copy it and say, all right, cool, I, I, can, I can do it exactly the way they do it. It's more of just learning the, the process and the approach and, and understanding what may be a good fit for you. And you together will combine a technique and a process that works well for you. So um, that, that is one thing that I, I definitely wanna make clear. Um, so Aaron, if you can, if you can take it away, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, that's a really good point. Like, um, I, I always, um, struggle with doing like demos. Cause I'm like, man, like people aren't gonna, you know, I, I want people to like kind of develop their own, um, sort of style, but also, you know, when I'm thinking back to what was most helpful to me when I was a student, is like, you know, seeing how other people work and, you know, at first when you start out, I think it's a lot of just like copying what other people do. Um, and, you know, trying to replicate it in some way and you're gonna get, you know, pull other things from other influences. And eventually if you do that enough, you're you're eventually gonna come with your, sort of your own style for lack of a better term, uh, which is always good. Um, always looking for, you know, new places of inspiration. Um, and so the, the, the demo that I'll be doing today um, is just kind of, you know, if, I'll go over a few different things um, from like my workflow in Photoshop and just some basic like, um, sketching techniques that I generally use. Um, so I won't, um, won't stop anymore. So I'll just get started. So usually what I do is in, in Photoshop, um, which is the main sketching program I use, um, just because I'm used to it and I don't have to, you know, a lot, a lot of people will, you know, do sketches in, in different programs. Um, I tend to like to just stay in, in one, um, one program for everything because it just makes the workflow a lot quicker. Um, I don't have to change programs um, and I can just kind of you know, keep in that flow state of, of sketching. Um, so generally when I'm starting out, I make um, you know, a, a piece of paper, canvas, what have you. Um, and this, the aspect ratio on this is just like 11 inches by 22 inches. It's just a proportion that I like. It fits the screen pretty well. It's you know, one by two. Um, and generally when I'm printing stuff in the studio, um, it's a big poster, so it's around the size. So it, it tends to scale pretty well. Um, and generally what, uh, when I want to start out um, in the workflows is I also want to be sure that I'm setting up my, um, my, my uh, work area, like my workspace, um, as I call it in Photoshop, to be, that's, you know, something that's really efficient. Um, so 
Are you guys still seeing my screen, by the way? I want to make double check. Yeah, we're, your, your screen's fine. Cool. Um, I didn't want to be uh, talking to a blank background. Um, no, no, you're, you're good. So I'll let you know if it disappears. Okay, cool. So the default Photoshop usually um, has uh, all the sketching tools, like this, this, um, this uh, toolbar that I'm moving around. It's usually on the left side um, up there. And when I first started, someone told me to, hey, take that and move it to the right side because you're right-handed. And so when, instead of having to reach all the way across to the left side of the screen, um, you're just right there in your hand. Since you're right-handed, you're already there and you don't have to, um, you know, make as much of a movement. And it doesn't seem like a lot, uh, but when you're spending like, you know, 14 hours uh, in Photoshop, uh, it can, you know, a few seconds here and there, it can actually save quite a bit of time uh, throughout the day. So I just, that's just something that I prefer, um, obviously set up your workflow the way you want. Um, and then I do the same thing because I use paths quite a bit. Um, I have the paths uh, window, which usually hides behind the layers channel, like uh, the, the layers menu, I just pull it off to the side. So instead of it being back here, I just pull it out here so that I can reference it and I can grab uh, my paths and I can, you know, do my different tools down here. That's just something I like again, um, you know, figure out what, what works for you. It's just, you know, an amount of time before you um, can get comfortable. Uh, the other thing I do is I use, um, instead of just using brushes, which um, I used to use where, you know, you go through all the different brushes here, I actually just um, set up tool presets so that all, when I have my brushes out, um, I have a few different ones that I can select through. Um, like for sketching, um, and I can just do it that way. Or if I want, um, you know, different like sizes of brushes, they're just really, really quick to grab. Um, and the same thing with erasers, when I want a different size eraser, you know, something that's, um, you know, more feathered or something that's hard edged, I can just switch that really easily. Um, so there's less, um, you know, clicking, of, you know, it's less movement, less physical movement. So that uh, ends up, you know, saving time in the long run, which is, always important because you want to be, um, you know, working as fast as possible because you got all those ideas in your head you want to get out, right? Um, so let's make a new layer. So when I'm starting out, so what I'm going to show is just kind of some basic, what we call, um, and in, in turn, I don't know if you have a different name for this, but we just call it ideation sketches. So yeah, no, that's it. This would be, um, you know, just, <laughs> I said skadoodles, sketch. Yeah, skadoodles, yeah. Just, Doodle, yeah, whatever you want to call it. idea out on the paper, document exactly. it. Exactly, so it'd be, um, you know, the beginning of, of a project or, you know, when I'm just starting out of something. Um, and I just want to start, like like Antonio said, just getting, you know, paper, you know, pen to paper and start um, doing it. And, and generally, you know, I'll do this uh, sometimes like on actual pen and paper, um, but it, it really translates this the same. It's it's easier. You don't have to scan it if you do uh, directly in Photoshop. Uh, but you know wherever the idea strikes you is always good. Um, so what I'll do is the first thing I'll do is on my background. I want to make sure that I'm not sketching in the background, uh, which I do all the time. And it's frustrating uh, because I forget. Um, I make a new layer and then I come over here and I put in like a mid gray, uh, something like this. And what I do is I press Alt Backspace. And then, so it gives me a little bit of a gray background. And then uh, what I do is I go to my filters up here in the top. I press filter and I go noise and I say add noise. And so this brings up this menu where you can adjust. It basically just adds speckles, uh, if you can see it, to um, whatever layer it's assigned to. And you can adjust the amount. You have way too much or not enough. And you just, I just kind of like to add a little bit of noise to the background um, just so that I have something more than just a blank white sheet of paper uh, to be sketching on. As you can see, when you zoom in, I don't know, I'm not sure how it's coming across on the, the screen. You can see it. Yeah, like where you have just a little bit more of a, a little bit of a texture, almost like a piece of paper. And then just like linen on, paper. Yeah, exactly. So just depending on how, how dark I want it to be, I'll come in and I'll just lower the opacity to whatever looks right to me, you know, just set up what you want. Um, you can also do this if you want to do it, um, like as a color background, whatever you want, whatever makes you feel comfortable. And then I make sure to lock that layer so that I don't actually draw on it. And then what I'm going to start doing is I'm just going to bring um, a new layer, which is um, Control Shift N, 
which is the button I use probably more than anything else. Just make a new layer because that makes all your mistakes go away. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll pick, um, you know, I just have it called sketching brush. Um, I don't know where I've just picked these brushes up uh, from the internet, just random places. Um, and I'll just start thinking about like, okay, so if you see, it's kind of like a thin uh, brush where like, you know, it's got the pressure sensitivity um, and you can kind of, it feels a lot like a pencil, especially, um, you know, depending on how like comfortable you get with it. It's really, I will say it's really, really weird to draw on a Cintiq when you're first starting out uh, because you're used to the pen and the paper. Uh, it just takes time to get used to. And now, I mean, when I go back to pen and paper, I kind of feel like I'm, uh, <laughs> I forgot how to sketch anyway. So <laughs> to uh, keep the skills up on everything. Um, that coefficient of drag that's different, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I know some people like to do um, on iPad and, you know, I have friends that work on iPads a lot, um, but this is just kind of the workflow I like. So I'm just like really just kind of warming up. I'm just drawing like lines. Um, something that Antonio will tell you is, you know, the warm ups and the practicing of straight lines is, is super important. Photoshop has this cool thing where you can cheat where you hold shift and it'll give you a pretty straight line pretty much anywhere. Um, and so you can start making these like nice shapes and just kind of get used to things and kind of see like, you know, how the, how the brush you're using, you know, layers up, is it the right size? Um, you know, you can change the brush size, make it smaller, make it bigger, um, and just kind of make sure that you, you know, you start feeling comfortable, start getting the flow. Um, and then I'm going to delete that and start a new layer. And so a lot of times when I'm sketching cars or sketching products, whatever, um, like we talked about earlier, is all, you know I like to start with um, with the user, with the person, and like what they're going to do. So a lot of times, really, when I'm in the beginning, I'm going to start out in like a dead top view or a dead side view. So like if I'm thinking like, all right, I want to do like a, this is the internet, so we'll make it exciting. So I want to do like a two person like a sports car. I'm going to just put uh, a center line, which would be this thing. So this is the, the center line. And uh, this gives me kind of an idea of like where I'm sketching and what everything looks like. And then I'll kind of come in and draw um, kind of the other borders of the vehicle. And maybe I'll say, okay, well, if, um, if my center line is here, center line of the vehicle is here, um, then I'll come in and just kind of between the edge of the vehicle and the center line, just kind of eyeball the middle. I'll put another light line in there and say, okay, that's my the center line of where my driver will sit. So that would be like where the um, steering wheel would be. So I'll put a little line there. And as you can see, I'm kind of starting to evolve the architecture um, of a vehicle kind of as we go. Um, and I'm just doing the interior because you know that's the, the coolest part, obviously. Um, and I'll start just kind of bisecting this and seeing like, okay, if my person is uh, is here, like from top view, and he wants to. We want to make sure that he can reach the steering wheel, um, and you know we'll start figuring out where they want to sit in the vehicle, and we'll kind of give them you know an idea. You know this is how far the controls need to be away, and make it a little more comfortable so he can bend his elbows. So one one question that came up on the on the chat was there on YouTube actually um, was, <clears throat> you know how how do you work with the exterior designers like what is that what is that conversation like I mean because right now as you can see you're starting to kind of ID it on the interior, but right. you know what where where does the dialogue you know between yourself or just understanding the package that's uh, been um, given from the exterior proportions where does that come into play. Yeah, so generally, like in my, in my studio, when we're starting off a project, we'll work pretty closely together um, to try to come with, you know, unique value propositions of, you know, what what the vehicle is. You know, we'll generally get like um, uh, like a creative brief is what it's called or a design brief where it shows like, you know, a lot of information about, you know, who the customer is um, that we're targeting, you know, what, you know, segment the vehicle is. Is it a SUV? Is it a coupe? Is it a... Um, you know, is it a truck? Is it, you know, et cetera. And um, we want to, we'll kind of work together and see um, what, you know, what kind of product we want to be. And then a lot of times we'll think, okay, we'll get a lot of information about, you know, who the customer is, what part of the world that they live in, you know, what, 
what um, you know, what's their income bracket, like what's what's that sort of thing, and you know, from there we'll start kind of developing like value proposition. So that I mean, the basic, the really the first step is figuring out you know what size the vehicle is. Um, you know, at, at work we'll call that like the platform. You know, is it? And Antonio, I'm sure you um, are still teaching this in DD one, but the you know the C D and E size, you know, sedans, SUVs. Um, yep. Or is it, you know, a segment that we, we don't know about yet, um, you know, and how does that, you know, what does it do for people? What do they need out of the vehicle? Um, so sometimes you'll have a lot of things like set up already, like you'll know your, your seating positions, you'll know um, where, you know, in the vehicle people need to be, you know, how many seats it's going to have. Um, and so usually that's where we'll, we'll, we'll kind of start out. Um, and it's always a balance because, you know, the, you know, exteriors and interior people are, you know, sometimes we um, are looking for different things, but uh, you know when we come to a you know a good um, kind of you know solution together is when things are the most powerful. Because um, you know, for whatever reason, cars cars resonate with people in in really interesting ways. So you know they are really important to people. They're you know something that people get really passionate about, which is something really cool to work on. We see how you know connected people are with. Um, with the products that you make. So it's, it's always fun. Yeah. So, uh, we have a, um, we also have a question here from, um, I believe it's a, uh, it's in, it's a teacher for a high school teacher that teaches product design and 3d modeling. And oh, cool. you know, his questions, you know, uh, is there anything you said, um, that you can suggest, um, that he really stressed to make sure, that he teaches or incorporates uh, into the classroom, and also again, you know, what are some of the things that you feel would, would help him get people uh, or get, get his students excited about about this uh, field? So I'll, I'll let you. Uh, I'll, I'd like to hear your take on it, and then maybe I can give him a take as well, just from you know the university side as well. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Just to hear that there's a there's a product design class in a high school. That's amazing. Um, that's like step number one. So. Whoever doing that, that's amazing. Like, thank you, thank you for doing that because we're always, you know, we want to get more people into, um, you know, this world because that's how, um, you know, new things, new things happen and new things get created it's by people that, you know, might not know about it. They come from the outside. That's, you know, my team is um, very diverse. Like, we we come from a lot of different backgrounds. We have, you know, engineers. We have, um, you know marketing people, we have, you know, um, computer uh, science people that, you know, all these different backgrounds coming together and it's something that's really powerful. And we don't, um, one thing that we really make sure that we try not to do is, is segment, like just because like, yeah, I might be on, you know, on paper, I'm like an industrial designer, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, the person who's, who's working on the visualization software doesn't have you know, some great ideas to contribute to that as well. So I think it's something that about being open and really like, you know, embracing you know, what maybe the, the um, you know, status quo might be. Um, and, you know, being open to, you know, provoking new ideas and uh, just, you know, inspiring, you know, creativity and, and openness, I think, is is the biggest thing. That's awesome to hear. I'm, je I'm jealous. I wish yeah. I had. That. <laughs> and I, and I think if if I'm if I'm pr pronouncing uh, her name cor correctly, it's uh, Kara uh, Oxner. And so, Kara, well, one thing that I would tell you uh, from from the perspective of the university is that you know, thank you again for for doing that service of exposing young young minds to these creative fields. Um, you know, kind of like Aaron, I've been kind of jealous in a way, you know, like I know for a lot of us industrial designers, one of the things that, you know, when we would go to our high school advisors and tell them we want to design cars, automatically we were told, okay, you want to become a mechanical engineer. And well, you know, being a mechanical engineer, it's, it's a great career as well too. You know, for a lot of uh, students who are, you know, more into the design part of it, it's not necessarily, you know, what they're after. Um, so I think the thing that I would stress to them is that, you know, being a industrial designer, whether that's in transportation design or product design, you're able to impact a lot of people's lives through the products that you design. And, you know, that's one of the things that 
I think all of us as industrial designers are really in love with is the fact that, you know, we get to make beautiful artifacts and, and wonderful artifacts that, you know, help people live a better life. And I know, uh, you know, Aaron touched on this a little bit earlier um, in saying that, you know, you really want to make sure that what you're creating is, is something that is going to improve someone's life out there. And I think, you know, when you do that and you get to work on projects like that, that you know you're making an impact, um, it's really rewarding. It's a really rewarding career path because of that. So, you know, I would tell, you know, the high school students that um, you know, if, if they want to have a voice in where we go as society and, and how you know, we interact with future products, um, you know, this is the field that they can get into where they'll have an impact on the way that we move forward as a society through the products that we generate. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's super, it's super cool. Sometimes you don't realize the amount of um, influence that you can actually have, especially when you, you know, really come to the table with, um, you know, things that aren't just about like, oh, I want it to look this way. It's like, you know, go beyond that and be like, okay, this person does this in their life. And if we do this this way, then they're going to be so much happier. And that's way more, way more, um, you know, convincing to, to tell someone rather than just like, oh, I, I think because I want it this way, it's, it should be this way, you know, yeah. uh, resonant as well. And, you know, if you can get them to see like what you see, which is like, okay, this, this person's life, you know, is affected in this way and we can do this to help them, then you just created another person fighting for that, that person. And, you know, they might see stuff that you don't even see and they bring a whole new aspect of like, oh, well that, you know, you're, when you said that, that made me think of this. And so I, I did this and, you know, it's this cool, like, um, kind of, you know, synergy that exists where like, you're all kind of working towards the same goals, which is, which is something that's so cool. Yeah, no, and, and then maybe if anything, I mean, and to, to finish with that too, is just the power of teamwork, right? Just, oh yeah, you, know, you, you as an individual um, can, can accomplish a lot of great things, but really when, when you get a team behind you and, and you're able to set a vision for your team to follow, that's really when you're gonna make an impact that is, is truly echoes across time for, for a long time. And I think again, the sooner you realize that again as a young creative is the fact that you know it is it is a team endeavor um you know the faster it is that you will grow creatively as a designer so that would be another thing too is you know don't be afraid to ask questions don't be afraid to get help and don't be afraid to to work in teams yeah yeah that was a big thing that you guys really pushed in uh in school when i was there i'm sure you guys do it even more now um, but that's something that really like companies obviously love to see, but like it trains you, um, you know, from the beginning, we get a lot of feedback that, you know, people from our school are so, um, you know, open and, you know, driven to work as a team. And it's something that you guys stress, which I think is really important because as a student, you're really not thinking about like, you're just thinking about trying to get your, <laughs> your 40 sketches done for Antonio on Monday. Uh, you're not thinking about, you know, working alongside you know, a team of people that you know, have all this to, to offer and you, know, you wanna be a good part of that team. So you wanna make sure that you're you know, a part of that too. And that's something that is one of those lessons you don't realize you're learning uh, until you're, you're done, you know, cause Antonio being Mr. Miyagi over there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's um, like I said, it's definitely, it's a fun endeavor too. And that's the other thing too, just if you see it as work, it becomes work. But if you're always having fun with it, you know, you don't really see it as, as something that, you know, don't see it as something you have to do. It's something that you want to do. You know, you pick this career path because you're passionate about design. So I think also too, just, you know, when you remind yourself of that, it, it also definitely brings a lot of things into perspective. You know, I mean, I remember in the studio just you know, you, you can lean back and smile and it's just like, wow, like I'm like, this is like what you said earlier. And it's like, wow, this is really a job. I'm really getting paid to do this. Like, this is, I have a voice. I have an impact on society. Um, yeah. The products that I design, like this is, this is awesome. It's super powerful. Um, yeah. It's hard to have a bad day. Hey team, there's a question from Gabriel out there. Um, it said, speaking to technology, if not already answered or discussed, are paramedics, Paramedic 
tools like Grasshopper use? Secondly, is VR or AR being used in the design process for both? And at what stage? Awesome I'll question. Yeah. So yeah. parametric design, you know, if you guys are incorporating that and also AR and VR, Aaron. Yeah. So the parametric stuff is, is super cool. There's a lot of people that are, um, you know, working on that. And we, you know, from like grill textures to, you know, wheel design or, you know, even textures on, on fabric, like some of the stuff you'll see on um, when Bronco comes out um, is definitely, they're definitely um, using that. And we have a whole, um, you know, studio at Ford uh, that is pretty much dedicated to, um, you know, moving forward with um, VR and um, what was it? VR and AR, was that the, the two questions? Yeah. So virtual reality and augmented reality. And, yeah. and for people who are, are maybe new to this, uh, virtual reality is completely immersive. So meaning you go into that environment, you create within that environment. Augmented reality is a mixture of, um, you know, real life, real world objects uh, overlaid with, um, with digital assets on top of that, whether it's a video, whether it's a 3D model, or whether it's an image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we use VR a ton. Um, we're, a, we're a really small studio um, and we have a couple of guys um, that work uh, with us who are like complete masters. They do mind blowing stuff in, um, in the VR, uh, in, in VRED or in other different programs that they, they know that I don't, um, I know, wouldn't know the first thing about how to even open the program. And they're just like using it like, uh, like the back of their hand. Um, so, so probably Gravity Sketch would be one of those. Yeah, Gravity Sketch uh, is a big one. Um, one of our one of the guys that I work with, Michael Smith, is um, he's massive into Gravity Sketch. I think he's um, he's one of like the top users in the country, and he just he's all day in his is in his VR glasses. Yeah, it's um, super cool to see um, all the stuff that you can do with it as it it comes out, um, and it's it's really powerful for um, you know communicating with, you know, our upper management, because, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, like, you know, whatever you're doing, like a sketch or you're doing a, you know, a, um, some sort of, you know, rendering, what you're trying to do is you're trying to communicate um, your idea to someone else. And so if VR can help with that, um, that's, VR is a huge tool for that because you can really immerse people in, you know, what you're talking about. And a lot of what we're talking about is, you know, based on the, you know, experience. It's not just about like, you know, the the one dimensional aspect of the pro product. So um, we're, sh we're able to show like how you actually interact with and live with the space. Um, so that's a, that's been a really cool tool for sure. We, we use it a lot um, and it's, you know, we just, every every chance we get, we, we want to find a new way to use it because it's, it's so powerful. Yeah, and, and I can tell you now um, at, at school where we're definitely teaching it. It's one of the tools that we, we teach our students, but you know, the, the most important thing that, you know, we try to communicate is the fact that like what Aaron just said is, it's just another tool to communicate your ideas, you know? Um, you know, I always tell the students, don't, don't fall in love with just using new technology just for the sake of using new technology. If it's applicable to what you're designing and what you're creating, and it's going to help you communicate your ideas, um, that much more efficiently, then by all means, go for it, you know? It's, um, and we do use HoloLens, we do use, um, we do use Oculus as well, and we use Gravity Sketch along with um, Alias uh, VR as well. Um, and so this has been, it's again, again for, for us as a school, you know, we, you know, the students really can't afford to make full-scale models, um, but using VR, they're able to evaluate their designs in one-to-one -one, and they're able to, to look at the design and walk around it, sit inside of it, experience it, reach out to the controls and whatnot. So, you know, having those tools available to them has been really transformative in, in how they go through the design process. Um, but again, at the end of the day, I would say, don't get caught up so much on, you know, are you using an iPad? Are you using a Cintiq? Are you using pen and paper? you know, are using VR goggles with, with Gravity Sketch, like obviously those tools are gonna be great and they're, they're gonna definitely help you. But at the end of the day, they're just tools to communicate your ideas. So 
I would say, you know, definitely continue to practice. Um, I still am a strong um, believer and proponent in just ballpoint pen and uh, and a uh, piece of paper, a piece of um, either uh, bond paper or just my moleskin. I, you know, usually moleskin goes everywhere with you if it's in your pocket. Um, and then from there, you know, you can definitely, um, you know, work on, on tools like this, like, you know, Aaron right now has a really nice delicate touch with um, with his Cintiq there because he's done so much sketching. Um, you know, that's muscle memory that builds and develops over time. And that comes through practice. And, you know, I was actually just having this discussion earlier with Melvin, uh, who's another uh, Ford designer um, that uh, Aaron went to school with. And we were having that discussion about, you know, for our design classes or our design drawing classes, you know, switching over to, to digital, which, you know, we feel really strongly about, but, you know, still keeping some analog components, like some assignments where you just have to pick up the ballpoint pen and, and bomb paper and just get to work because it builds up that, that uh, muscle memory there. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And it's something that I think is, um, you know, it's really apparent when, you get to the studio, like when you get to the studio, everyone can sketch pretty much better than you in most cases. Um, and that's what I've always found. Um, and, you know, everyone's sketching on paper, everyone's sketching on, you know, Cintiq, every, you know, everyone has their own style. So there's no, there's no one way to do something. Um, yeah. You know, I know people that can, you know, do you know, such amazing stuff with just a piece of paper and a ballpoint pen. And I'm over here with my like Cintiq and Photoshop, just feeling like a, a loser because I, you know, <laughs> But it's, it's something that you really you really can't replicate is the idea, you know, of the feeling of, you know, sketching on paper because it's something that, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's something that's, you know, in human DNA or something, but it's just something that's so special that, you know, it's, it's something that you really cherish every time you get to, every time you get to do it. But yeah, when, when Antonio said is absolutely right, like there's no, there's no, um, you know, app or, well, I, I speak now, I'm sure in a month there's going to be an app comes out that proves me <laughs> wrong, but, you know, there's never an app that's going to be able to sketch for you or that's going to be able to, um, you know, design well for you. Um, I'm sure people are trying and, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll get there, but uh, for now, uh, <laughs> hopefully nothing uh, comes that puts us out of the job, but, uh, but yeah, it's always important to be able to, again, like it just comes down to, com you know, communicate your ideas to to someone else and get them to see things from your point of view um, so that you guys can get on the same page and you can work together on stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point you bring up because, you know, we do have the rise right now of like uh, generative design and, uh, you know, a lot of tools that make some of the process, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, automated, but you know, to me, at the end of the day, you know, if we're designing products for humans, you know, it's it's almost like they have to have that human touch, that human imperfection to be appealing to humans. You know, I think if, if something's too perfect and sterile, then it kind of loses its appeal. Um, so, you know, I, I think we'll be safe for a while as long as, again, we are the, the target market, um, you know, so. But, uh, but definitely, you know, I, I would say don't shy away from the technology. Don't, you know, don't don't feel like, okay, I, I, I this is not for me. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I'm going to need this. This is one of those things where you embrace it if it works for you. Um, and again, if it makes sense, you know, with the project that you're working on. So um, another question that came up here was uh, regarding uh, the modeling program, you know, so the question is, is Rhino still used or has it become obsolete or do we use something different? So Aaron, I'll, I'll let you answer that, or I can also chime I'm in. A, on that as well. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a one trick pony. I, I pretty much only know Alias. Uh, yeah. and Red. Um, I wish I knew more, like I wish I knew SolidWorks, um, but you know, it's just something that where, you know, I think becoming, you know, really proficient in one software was the way, kind of the way I, I took because I knew it was, you know, what they use in, in my industry. So I, I spent the time to really become good at that. And um, that's just another advantage you can have over, um, you know, other people when you're when you're competing is like, you know, if you know how to, you know, take a sketch and you can you can turn it into something real um, and something tangible, then 
you know, quicker without having to go through, you know, another, you know, another source or someone else having to, you know, do this for you, then, you know, you just save that much time and you become that much more um, effective as a designer. So I think it's, again, like what you said, uh, you know, what we were just talking about with the last question, it's like, it's less about, you know, what is a specific program and more about like, you know, can you use this program? Can you, you know, adapt to new things? Um, but the, the the program I primarily use is um, it's called Alias Autodesk Alias, yeah. um, and it's specifically um, I think uh, I think it's, I don't know if many product design studios use it anymore, but I know it's it's pretty much the industry standard as far as um, automotive design goes. Um, yeah. But we also um, I still think Apple uses it. Um, that's, yeah, that's the thing that sucks because I, I would love to, because generally, like, just to go back to what I'm doing in a demo, um, generally, like, at this stage, like, I would spend maybe 10 or 20 more minutes on this, and I would actually just start, jump right into um, to Alias and start building because, like I said, it's, it's so much quicker. Um, but a lot of people are starting to use Maya as well. Yeah. Um, that's a big one. And the other one, Gravity Sketch. Um, Blender is another uh, really popular one. So there's all these new things coming out and I'm kind of like wanting to see which one, uh, you know, wins out and then, you know. Learn really that, one. that one. Yeah, Yeah. so I mean, I think, I think Rhino is still used to, you know, when um, for parametric modeling with the Grasshopper um, plugins. So that's definitely, but you know, I think also Autodesk now has new tools like Dynamo that plug directly into, um, that plug in directly into Alias as well too. So really it's just a tool that, that works for you, that, that, you know, it's comfortable for you that I would say, you know, get really good at one. And at the end of the day, if you get really good at that one and, and it allows you to communicate your, your ideas quickly and efficiently, then that's going to be the right one. So you know, I, I would tell you, you know, don't don't get too caught up in trying to learn too many of them, um, you know, but for, for automotive, definitely, you know, Autodesk uh, alias is, is definitely going to be the industry standard. If you if you're interested in VR sketching, you know, gravity sketch is great. It's fun. It works on the Quest, which is just a standalone. Um, so you don't need a computer for it. It just works directly on your VR headset. Uh, and like I said, you know, that's been a really powerful one just because you know, kind of like what Aaron's doing right now, he's throwing down a lot of sketch lines and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's going through different iterations of, of the design. But, you know, the, the nice thing about VR sketching too is that you can do something similar to this, but you're able to see, you know, the design in 3D space. Um, but the great thing here is that, you know, Aaron's probably bringing this idea to life and being able to share the idea much faster and someone necessarily doing it in, uh, in gravity sketch right now or in, in just in VR sketching. Um, but, you know, that obviously is going to change as the tools become better. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but again, definitely stay up on it. Um, I still, again, would recommend pen paper. It's cheap, it's easy to get, just get a nice ballpoint pen uh, and, and practice your visualization skills that way. Yeah, 100%. Antonio, uh, maybe you could speak to this because I, I actually had an email come in from a student um, and what that student was more concerned about is not having a background in design and being able to go into a program like this. Uh, do you think you'd speak a little bit to maybe some of those students that are exploring this, but maybe you're intimidated that they don't have a background? Well, I, I would say I think the all those software vendors now are doing a great job of including great tutorials with their software. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, you know, just a lot of them, if, if you're in a school and you have a .edu account, you're able to get a lot of these softwares for free and you can download it to your computer and try it out. Um, and like I said, at that point, um, there's a lot of YouTube tutorials. I mean, that's one thing that, you know, I think when Aaron was in school, it was just the infancy of it where, you know, people started kind of sharing their process of how they would, uh, different techniques. But I think now, I mean, you can find pretty much yeah, it's on YouTube really quickly on, and, and find some, some good tutorials. Now, obviously, you know, when you do get to school, when you do, you do get to university and you're being taught by working professionals, 
you know, you, you're going to have a, a much deeper understanding of what you're doing and how you're designing things. But again, just to get started and to, you know, start working on your craft, definitely, you know, research it. Um, I, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of tutorials that, you know, we'll be doing like kind of like what Aaron's doing right now. I mean, he's essentially doing a tutorial just on, you know, visualization of an interior design concept. Um, we're going to continue to be doing these as well, too. So, you know, definitely check back with us. Um, and the other thing, too, if you're in high school, you can you can definitely join one of our art experience programs where, um, you know, you'll be taught as well by by a working professional that will give you different tips and different advice. On, on how to use these tools. Um, and for me, again, I mean, you guys are always welcome to reach out to me as well. I mean, I am a big advocate of industrial design and you know, I, I, I definitely want to um, expose as many students to, to this, this awesome field. Um, and so, yeah, definitely the, the resources are out there and uh, you know, Hector can share my contact information with you as well. And, uh, and then at that point, I can, I can connect you with some other tools that, that we can talk about behind, scene, behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, 100% to echo that. Like, um, I, had, uh, I had no design experience whatsoever before I came to, uh, to school out there. And, um, you know, I was definitely at a disadvantage from like, some of the kids who had, you know, been drawing and, you know, designing stuff their whole lives. Um, but that was, that was something that was part of the challenge, you know, it's, it's something that's always good. I, I worked at UPS uh, loading airplanes before I, I moved out there to, uh, to start learning how to, to draw and do this as a job. So, you know, don't let anything stop you, you, you know, you can do anything. Um, and it's, it's a great program, you know, a lot of great instructors that you know, work in the industry that can show you um, what's going on. Get that. Could you try again? I thought I was talking to her. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, it, it happens to me all the time. Siri always <laughs> wants to join in, the, in on the fun. <laughs> so you, you were saying again, sorry, you cut out there. Yeah, yeah. So I was just saying like, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's no, there's no right path or like, you know, journey that you have to have. There's no, um, you know, correct direction to get into industrial design. Like, like I said, I, I work with people from, you know, all different backgrounds um, yeah. only, you know, myself and a few other people are traditionally, you know, trained, you know, quote unquote industrial designers. And, you know, we're complimented by people that, you know, work in different fields and know different things. And, and that's one of the best things that, you know, is, is so challenging because I always want to, want to make sure that, you know, what I'm doing is relevant and, you know, I'm not becoming obsolete. So. Yeah. One, one other question yeah. that came in, Aaron, I think that also, um, you know, we didn't address earlier, but um, basically, um, how do you know what best technology features to feature in your designs? So, you know, when you're thinking of the user and you're thinking of who you're designing for, um, you know, what are what are some of the things that you look for in incorporating? Do you look at more like what's a feature, what's a technology feature that's trending, or do you look more of like you know, what, what does this user really need and want and what are their anticipated needs and wants and then try to find a technology that suits the, uh, that objective. So how, do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's always, you know, an interesting balance because there's kind of a tendency in a lot of, you know, I'm definitely guilty of this. It's like, um, you know, you, you see, you know, technology or you think you see something new, you want to, you know, think technology first. Um, and you want to immediately like, oh, let's, we need to use this new, this new thing and this new thing and uh, that new thing. Um, and a lot of times that can, that can kind of, you know, hinder the process of, of creating something that, you know, people really think is, you know, important and like valuable to them. And so a lot of things that we focus on, especially as a studio is, you know, building, building the experience first. So, so there's, you know, kind of a feature led uh, kind of, standpoint uh, of design and uh, product creation. And then there's like the experience led side, which is something that Ford is really trying to embrace. So it becomes less about like, what technology do we need? Uh, and you know, what, what technology can we um, add for the sake of technology? Which, you know, there's definitely times when that is, is necessary and is the right move. But something that we're really focusing on is like, okay, what is, what is the experience that 
you know, we as a team want to want to deliver and, you know, let's build that out. And once we kind of have an idea of what we want to do and how we want, you know, the customer's life to be for, you know, lack of a better term, then we start looking at, okay, what, you know, what are the pieces of technology that we're going to need to, to enable this? So it's kind of like, uh, a give and take between like, you know, do you think about the tech first? Uh, because, you know, we work with a lot of suppliers um, and they're always, you know, showing us the, you know, cutting edge stuff and it's, uh, it's always so amazing. Um, and we're thinking we have to be really disciplined and not get like, you know, too overly excited of something that maybe not, you know, while it's an amazing technology, it might not be the best fit for, you know, the certain customer that we're, um, you know, designing for at that time. Um, so that's, that's a big kind of tension that we have that we always, um, not tension in a bad way, I should clarify it's a tension as far as like, you know, do we want this or do we want that? You know, it's, it's a ten tension in a, in a positive way. So yeah, it's a struggle that we have. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes back to, um, you know, a similar discussion that we just had about, you know, different technologies available to sketch, right? And, and different programs available to 3D model. You know, it's like you, you have to step back and just ask yourself, okay, you know, which one's going to be, you know, the best fit for what I'm trying to accomplish. And I think uh, if you use that as a, as a guiding principle, um, it, it definitely, you know, makes your job easier and it, and it allows you to stay focused and stay on target on, on what the actual end goal is. So, um, like I said, that's, that's really good that, you know, for, for you to give them that perspective that you know, really it comes back, like you said, it's what are we trying to do for the customer? What is this customer? What are their anticipated needs, their anticipated wants, and, and where does this technology fit inside of that? So, um, yeah, no, this is awesome seeing now you uh, fill in the forms here as well. And yeah, so, so, so what I do is I start like just with the Polygon and Lasso tool, which is this tool right here. Um, you have the regular, the you know, lasso tool and you have the polygon lasso tool. Um, and what this lets you do is just really quickly, um, you know, just pick points so you can make it really choppy and big, um, or you can click, um, you know, smaller points and you can actually get some pretty good curvature um, and really be pretty accurate with what you want to do. Um, and you can just kind of select, you know, I'm, I start with like kind of the bigger volumes, like this is a seat. As you can see, like what I did was I just took this um, top view sketch uh, and kind of use it as a base architecture to kind of sketch, you know, in, in perspective or 3D kind of the idea of what the interior might look like. So I'm just starting to kind of build that up um, as, you know, a, a drawing, as a sketch to kind of, you know, give a little bit more detail into, um, into what we're showing. And so I know we're um, now we have this um, block selected. And so what I'll do is I'll press command and I'll click on that layer again. And that's gonna reselect what I just selected. And then now that I've got my color, I'm gonna pick this color again. And then I'm gonna grab, go in here and maybe choose like a little lighter tone, something like that. And then I'm gonna make a new layer on top of this. And with my um, big feather brush, I'm gonna come in on top and I'm gonna start adding a little bit of light to the top of this to start, um, what, what I would call like describing the form. Um, and this is straight out of Antonio's uh, DD1 class where you use um, pastel and chalk. It's the same principles, it's just different tools. Um, kind of like we were wow. talking earlier. Dark to light's coming back. Dark to light, yeah. <laughs> um, and one thing that you learn, uh, when, you look at, when you look at objects, you kind of realize how like nothing, there's no, nothing is a flat color, like everything, kind of shows up as a gradient. So like, even though this is kind of like a one dimensional um, plane right here, it, uh, it's important to kind of show that, you know, there's, there's light coming in, there's, there's things happening, there's, um, there's different uh, light sources happening. I'm actually darkening this up a little bit. And there he's just adjusting the hue and the saturation. Um, yeah, I want it to be a little bit more red. So what I do is um, I press control, uh, what is it? I'll try it again. It's you, I believe. Control U. And what you can do is like, I have this color, which I thought I liked at the beginning, but now I'm thinking maybe it's a little too orange. Um, and so I'm gonna adjust it. You can adjust it to pretty much any color um, and just whatever you see fit, you can make it more or less saturated. 
and I want something a little bit more like a deep red. So I'm gonna sketch like that. And then uh, I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna actually delete those. Start over with uh, my new shade that I just got. And I'm gonna take, and actually what I can also do here is like, if I want to you know, quickly do this, I can take a selection of this. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm selecting all the surfaces that are on the top because generally those will be the ones that are catching light. And so what I'm gonna do, I see I have this on its own layer. Um, if I turn the line drawing off, you can see it's just kind of this blob. What I can do is I can press Control J, which duplicates what I had selected. So now it's just that. And what I can do here is I can press Control U again, and I can bring the lightness up. And that gives me a little bit more of a, of a high tone. And so then I can come in here with the eraser uh, and start erasing away to kind of describe that form a little bit more. Um, and then I can press Cont Command or Control um, and click on this layer again. And I can come in with my um, my darker color and start showing some of the areas that you know. So on that, on that part right there, is if you can just show them that you're using a soft airbrush. That was one of the questions from YouTube. Is yeah, you know, how, how do you get that delicate shading? Um, yeah. So if you can just show them a preview of the brush and how so, ma massive that actually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so this brush, I'll just grab it over here. Um, it's just a it's just a brush that. Um, it's just a, I think it's the default um, airbrush in Photoshop. Default airbrush, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, I may be wrong. Don't don't hold me to that. Um, but it's something where it, it, it responds to print pressure. And so the, I really like to start out really light. So I can just layer up the value really slowly. And then if I really want to, I can get it get a lot darker, right? Yeah. And then I have the same thing. Um, with so the one thing that he did there, as he got darker, you notice he made the, the brush size smaller too, yeah. so he can control yeah. where that darkness was going. Exactly. And so I have a soft eraser here as well. Um, so you can, you can kind of come in and do that same thing uh, if you want to, um, you know, erase, you know, with a soft eraser, you can do that. And then you can also, another technique is to take a hard eraser um, and erase like that. So you can have like a, a hard line in something. So that's another another technique. So it's just it's just layering, it's just being really delicate more than anything. It's just you know having a light touch uh, with the brush and making sure that you're you know being careful and really like building up slowly um, and you know just kind of having fun with it, kind of seeing where light lays. Um, and then I'm going to select this upper part again, and I'm going to grab my my brush again, which is the name of the brush is just the size of pixels that it was when I like saved the tool preset. So that's all that means. Um, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to take I'm going to sample this color, and then I'm going to make it a little bit lighter, um, and just kind of start dusting the top of it a little bit more, and um, start showing like where it might be. Um, so once I've got that kind of sort of laid out, then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to select uh, what would be like the, the environment or like, you know, in this case, the door and a little bit of the, the dashboard. And again, I'm just using that polygon lasso tool and trying to just select this big swath because I've kind of, what I do is I start with kind of the focal point. So I know that I want that seat um, to kind of be the main part of the drawing. And so I did that first, just kind of remind myself of where, you know, I want people to focus. Um, and then, so now that I've got this big part selected, I can come in um, and I want to put a layer behind uh, this layer. So I'll come in uh, and add a new layer and I might take like, uh, you know, mid, mid gray or something, maybe like that. Um, or maybe I could do, I just want to just keep it the same color. What do you guys think? Uh, and then I'll come in here and I will just uh, fill this, which is just all backspace. And that fills that whole thing the same color, right? And it looks really one dimensional now. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust the hue a little bit and make sure that we're still nice and saturated. We're getting the right shades, we lighten it up a little bit. And then from there, what we can do is we can start coming in and bisecting this and applying different um, shaders to it. So one thing I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna take my big eraser and as it gets further from kind of the, the middle of the drawing, I'm gonna kind of erase out a little bit, that's too much, um, just a little bit to kind of give it, you know, a little bit of, of a gradient. Um, as Antonio taught me, 
know, nothing is nothing is flat. Nothing, everything kind of is a is a continuum. Um, so now I've got that. Then I'm going to come in and I'm going to kind of segment this other piece that I have kind of sitting here that holds the steering wheel. And I'm going to just select this and um, kind of make that its own part. And then I'm going to make another new layer. I can move that on top. Um, I always keep the, the line drawing itself on the top layer um, just to make sure that I don't draw over top of it. Sometimes I'll lock it, sometimes I forget. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not you know, drawing on top of that. And then I'm going to make, you know, I want a little bit of contrast. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to find like a darker, maybe like a black color. And uh, I need to cut out. I'm going to do here, I'm going to cut out because I want the steering wheel to feel hollow. So I'm going to hold L, I'm going to press L, and I'm going to hold the option or the alt key. And this is going to be able to let me select things, uh, basically deselect the middle of the steering wheel so that um, when I do that, now my selection just shows um, what's outside of, oops, what's outside of the layer. So now that I have that, I can take my, my darker gray and I can fill this in here. And so that starts to feel like uh, you're starting to see like, you know, separate parts. Get that. Oh, Could you try again? Uh, so we start looking at um, that again. And so I'll come in and kind of just so you can see, I just threw in a new layer. And to the attendees, again, you guys keep the questions coming. And I know for me, it's, it's always, uh, you know, it's always awesome to see, you know, different uh, people's approach and, you know, even as Aaron is, is referencing some of the things that, you know, we covered in school, um, you know, he's definitely evolved and made it, you know, his own thing. And it's, it's, for me, it's actually really awesome to kind of see how, how he's breaking down the sketch. Um, so again, if any questions come up around that, I know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit over time here, but it's, it's fine. We're going to keep going for a little bit more, uh, you know, give Aaron a chance uh, to block in some of these volumes. Um, and I mean, as you guys can see right now, he's bringing a lot of life to the sketch already. It's, it's becoming much more three-dimensional as, as he's revealing the parts of the design that are upward facing and, and the parts of the design that are downward facing or facing away from the light. Yeah, hundred percent. So you're just showing again, like, there's a lot of light coming from there. Um, you know, there's maybe this is some like glossy, like black plastic piece on IP. Um, it's called this instrument panel. A lot of people don't know what that means. I didn't when I started, but I started saying it like I did. And then I found out what it meant. <laughs> He's like, yeah, the IP, what's the IP? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's an IP, I guess. Uh, there's so many, we had a new guy start and he just like, came out to me one day, he's like, okay, I need to know what all these words are. And he had all these, like a notebook full of like, uh, you know, abbreviations and like terms, like, so we went through it, it was, it was fun. There was a lot, I didn't realize how many we use on a daily basis. You get, uh, Ford is famous for that. Um, so then I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna bring this down a little bit. show where we are and then what i'm going to start doing is um so i'm going to start denoting the forms um and all the different uh you know sides of everything that i've sketched and kind of the environment like we were talking about so i'm just select making selections if you hold shift when you have the um polygon lasso tool selected um it lets you add to your selection the same way if you hold alt um you can delete from it and I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna get my color again. I'm gonna make it just a little bit darker. I'm gonna start shading in um, some of these other areas to show like, okay, if I have um, something rising up right here or on this side, it's going into the bottom. It's gonna get a little darker as the light kind of plays off of it. Um, and I'll make a new layer on top of that where I'll take this um, color again and I'm gonna make a little bit lighter version of it and I'm gonna start just kind of showing like how the, the sun is gonna read on it or whatever light source it is. Maybe it's in a parking garage, you know, it's, the world is your oyster. You can make, tell whatever story you want, basically. Yeah. 
So I'm just doing this quick. Again, this is showing like when I'm thinking for myself, uh, you know, when I'm at the beginning of a project, like the way I tend to approach things. Um, so obviously this is just, you know, my, my quick and dirty ways of kind of showing different ways of describing forms, different ways of describing like the shape of things and um, kind of how, how things come together. So we'll start putting since um, we have this um, like dashboard part in the middle, I'm gonna start coming in and adding some shadow to the bottom of it. Basically showing that, you know, this thing is, um, is, you know, in space, you know, kind of where it is in relation to the driver, to the passenger. Um, it kind of, it also, when you use a shadow, you can also, um, it's a really good way to kind of show, um, you know, instead of just drawing like a contour line, if you can just use um, the shadow to kind of denote where things go up and where they go down, um, it's a really, really cool way to do that. And so what I'll, what I'll do here, usually when I do shadows, what I do is instead of using the brush like you saw earlier, which you can totally do um, if that's what you want to do. Um, but another way that I found that's really cool, make a new layer here. And what I'll do is I'll press G, which is the gradient tool over here. And up here, when you, you have all these different ones you can select. So the, the one that I have selected goes from a color or a value to uh, being a, 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 a transparent. transparent so, yeah, so it'll basically start with a value on one side and it'll go to nothing at the end. What I also did was I turned the opacity down to 10%. So I can come in with a, with a dark color, like you know a really purple shadow or something like this. And I can really slowly start to build up value um, and then, as you can see, it just kind of gives you a really nice, um, you know, it feels like an actual shadow. And then you can come in um, and you want to make maybe a certain part darker, add more shadow to that area. Um, and you can just do the same thing, keep selecting stuff. And then hit the gradient tool again, and it gives you kind of a little separation. You know, this is further under, so it's going to be darker. And maybe yeah. petals are going to be... Um, you know, a darker color as well. So we'll take one of these tones out of uh, the IP, which quickly throw a little value on them. And even down below, if we want to get really fancy, we can put a little um, drop shadow off of those. So and one then, thing that I want to point out that is helping uh, Aaron a lot is the fact that when he did his initial line work, um, he did add some contour lines. So it makes it easier for under, for him to understand which forms are facing which direction. And that's been uh, really helpful for him as he's developing the, the form here that you guys see. And I mean, as you guys can kind of already start to see, it becomes much more of a three-dimensional world now that we clearly can see three different uh, values there, you know, and, and the, the number one value facing the light source directly the number three value facing away from the light, which is the darkest value, and then the midtones that are the number twos. Yeah, exactly. Everything, I mean, everything, it, you know, you can get really complex, but everything basically, uh, like I learned in uh, perspective class, first class, everything lives in a box. And that's true for lighting as well. So just break everything down to its most, um, most basic parts and, uh, you know, just bite off as much as you can chew and just just think about it in the most simple ways possible. Don't make it too, too hard on yourself. So those of you guys that need an update for the World Series, well, maybe I won't give an update. I don't want to spoil it. The spoilers? <laughs> now they already started texting me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Hector's already uh, jumping up over there. Yeah, I'm good. I'm feeling good. <laughs> this has been my month. <laughs> I bet. All right. Um, so really yeah, like I said, it's awesome though, seeing just again how just a little bit of line work that you're adding there, you know, how, or the, not the light work, but the, the gradations and how that's really defining the form. 
Yeah, so it's, it's something that's really quick too. And another thing you can do is you can always like turn off your line work and see like kind of how things are looking. Um, I like to do that sometimes where like I'll take it and I'll kind of see what it looks like without the line work, like play with how, you know, dark the line work is, you know, play with you know, turning it off, really start to try to describe the forms as much as I can. Um, and then another thing that's important that was a big thing that helped uh, when I realized is like how much blue is actually in your sky, your like your light sources. So like when I'm, you know, towards the end, since we're short on time, I'm going to kind of show some more tricks is like, uh, you know, when you, when you get to the stage and you want to make something like really kind of pop, is an easy way to do that, especially with a red sketch or something is to take and just add a little bit of, of blue to the very top of the highlight so that, you know, with red, it's difficult because a lot of times we think that the brightest spot on a red is going to be like a white or something. But in reality, that kind of ends up looking really like pink and that's not necessarily what we want. Um, and so you just take and you make a new layer and you just add a, just a tiny hint of blue just to the top where it rolls over, where it's getting all that light coming in. Yeah, nice. So we'll see kind of how that starts to make it feel like it's a lot brighter, but it's not necessarily being washed out with pink. Um, and then once you're done with that, you come in um, again, you kind of just add another little sliver of white at the, at the edge in certain spots just to get it really reading like it's, you know, a really bright piece of, of, of light coming through where the, where the headlights or where the, the sun would be. Yeah, so you know, that's, oh, that's yeah. advanced though. That's really, you know, going at it at, from, uh, you know, adding color contrast as well as value contrast. And, and, you know, one reason, uh, that works so efficiently is because the world around us, around us is that's how we see it. You know, we're used to upward facing surfaces being cooler because typically blue, the blue sky is reflecting on them, especially, you know, in automotive surfaces, whether they're in the interior or the exterior, you're going to have those upward facing surfaces, you know, definitely be a lot more on the cooler side of things. So that's a really advanced technique that, uh, that Aaron just covered there, that it's one of those things that really takes a sketch from being just a nice sketch into being an exceptional sketch. As you can see, I didn't like the way that the shading had come through on the, uh, the seat. So I'm just changing it to match the color of the, the rest of the sketch. Um, and again, like I'm probably spending more time than I would um, normally on, on this level of sketch, just cause I like to get them done quick so that I feel like I'm, you know, creating as much ideas as possible. Um, but you know, it's something fun. Cause at this point I would usually jump into, um, like a CAD software. And so I would just take this, you know, I've got my top view. I've got kind of a general idea of, of what I want something to look like. And then I would just start kind of building it in 3d and actually figuring out the surfaces. Um, which would enable me then to, um, you know, get some rough surfaces put together and then, you know, take that into, you know, either VR or into um, some sort of rendering software where I can make, you know, a really, um, you know, really compelling image that really sells what I'm talking about. Because not every, you know, as designers, we can always, um, we can always read sketches and we can read, you know, even a bad sketch and we can know, you know, what someone is intending. Uh, but a lot of people can, especially when you're talking to people, um, you know, who don't have design backgrounds and who, you know, don't have the imagination that we do uh, because they don't work in this, this kind of world as much. And so it's, it's really important to be able to, to communicate with those people as well. And so you want to be as clear as possible. Yeah, no, I mean, awesome. This is, like I said, it's, it's magical to watch always, you know, just seeing you uh, slowly develop the forms and, um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's also good that you, you're mentioning that, that, you know, part of your process is also ch checking the spatial uh, design, you know, making sure that things are, you know, in the right place as well. And a lot of times, like you mentioned earlier before, you know, in the studio, depending on what you're working on, you may already have a package that, you know, you're going to, to fit the theme on. And in other cases, you know, you may be developing that package from the beginning um, but again, getting it into 3D uh, makes it much more of a, 
a tangible uh, geometry that you can evaluate and look at. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's, but again, here, just seeing this and seeing you develop the forms is, is pretty, pretty awesome and really fun to watch. Any other questions uh, from the panelists? Um, we're gonna wrap up here in, in, in about 10 minutes. And, uh, no pressure, Aaron, just keep having fun, <laughs> talk us through it. Um, but yeah, we'll wrap up in 10 minutes. And uh, as, as uh, Hector mentioned earlier, you know, we're definitely gonna be sending out a, uh, a link to the recording of this. So, you know, if you did have to leave early or if you do have to leave early, that, that's fine. I know we had someone who, uh, I believe they're on the East Coast there. So, um, you know, it was approaching uh, bedtime for them. So uh, we'll definitely send out the video and uh, I'm sure, you know, Aaron, once he's done with the sketch, um, if, uh, you know, he will be able to share it as well too, just as a, a quick little skadoodle. Um, yeah, for you guys I'll, to uh, look at. I'll on my Instagram, I'll send you guys a JPEG. Um, again, if anybody awesome. has any other questions or like other stuff, feel free to reach out. Uh, just Aaron Gould on Instagram. It's pretty much where I am mo the most active. So we I'm can active. put your, uh, we can put your handle on there. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. I, I think, you know, if you guys follow us on Instagram as well, we'll put, um, you know, at Academy Art uh, ID, uh, as well as Aaron Gould. Um, you guys can find us there. We'll definitely follow up with a, a post, um, you know, from, from Aaron and, uh, and a post from ourselves. Again, just giving you guys an update of that uh, location for the video. Um, and also, again, um, the artwork. Uh, one question that came in is, uh, do you set up vanishing points before sketching in perspective? And this is I from Clark. A lot. I used to have to. Um, it's just something that comes with time or maybe just a bad habit. But no, I, I generally don't. Um, if I'm drawing something, especially if I'm drawing something like this that I'm really used to drawing, um, like a, a car interior, I've done it a lot. So that's not something that I necessarily need to set up each time. Uh, but if I'm going to draw something, you know, let's say I want to put a background in a sketch or I want to, you know, draw some sort of maybe an environment. Um, and yeah, I'll totally put some, you know, at least a horizon line, uh, just kind of give myself, um, like a somewhat like of a idea of where things are. Uh, they might not necessarily make it to the final sketch, but like, I'll definitely, if I need them, I'll reference them. But when you're starting out, they're super helpful because that's what, that's what makes you understand, uh, you know, perspective, which is, which is not an easy thing. Yeah, I would say if you're starting out, definitely, um, you know, practice putting in some vanishing points, even if they're off the paper, um, that's fine. Um, it just, it, it's a really good habit. And until you build the muscle memory where, you know, you have some of these perspectives memorized, um, it's definitely a good way for you to give yourself um, some context of the three-dimensional world that you're creating. So um, I, I do think, you know, with time, obviously, you know, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be a necessary step for you to take all the time, but um, if you're just learning, um, definitely one of the easiest things that you can do to quickly improve your, um, your visualization skills is just to include your, your vanishing points. Yeah, 100%. Right now what I'm doing is sometimes I'll do this is um, I'll actually just turn the line work off of the sketch and I'll see, you know, can I describe this without the line work? Because you know, as you saw, it was kind of messy and it was kind of, um, you know, maybe a little bit distracting. So it was really rough. And so I'm saying like, can I, can I quickly, you know, take the lines and kind of make this more of like, you know, some sort of painting style where you can still describe the forms and maybe it's a little bit more, you know, engaging to the person looking at it so that it's not just, um, line work. I don't always keep the line work off when I do this, but it just helps to show and make sure that I'm, you know, things are reading the way I want them to. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not confusing things because the thing to remember when you're sketching is like, you know, what you're drawing, you know, what you're trying to communicate. Uh, but the person that is looking at it generally does not And so it's on you to number one, communicate that, like, this is what, um, you know, this is what I'm saying. This is my idea. But also another um, thing to remember is like, 
it's always good to leave a little bit of, of room for someone to see what they want to see in a sketch uh, because yeah. people want to be involved in the design process. Like that's a, such a big part of design thinking is like they want to like almost complete um, complete it in their head and that makes it so that, you know, they see like, oh, you're doing this and it's something that maybe you didn't even notice that uh, was happening and it's something that turns out being really cool. So that's something that I always, I always tell people like, don't go, don't go too far. Don't, don't answer every question. Leave a little bit of uh, a mystery. I, I think uh, some of that goes back to, you know, like you said, you, you leave it up to people's imagination to kind of fill in and, and they become part of the process. Um, I think, you know, one thing that you can probably relate it to is, um, you know, always the difference between the book and the movie, right? You know, why, why is it that, you know, most of the time people are so enamored with the book more than the movie? And, and a lot of the reasons behind that is the fact that when the book, you know, your imagination got to fill a lot of those things in and you were part of, you know, making that world where when you're watching a movie, you're watching someone else's interpretation of that world. And so a lot of that's, that creativity has already been done for you. So, you know, I think again, the power of, of, of a sketch, leaving a little bit to the imagination, um, you know, definitely makes it so that it's more compelling and, and people gravitate towards it a little bit more than the ones that are just kind of tightly finished and completely provide a solution without no room for interpretation. And then at that point, it's just kind of like, okay, well, that's a statement. I'm really not involved in that anymore. It's just it's someone's statement on, on what this thing should be. But with a new sketch like this, um, you know, I, I think Aaron's leaving a little bit of that to, to your imagination to kind of fill in some areas uh, and then, you know, make it more of a conversation starter on, on some of the things that you can incorporate into the design. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a really good point with uh, the book and the movie. I'm gonna steal that uh, that analogy. Uh, but yeah, that's that's totally it. I mean, it's it's you know people want to be part of the process, and you know it's it's important to to let them do that. All right, and again, those of you guys that are uh, that are joining us here, um, again, you guys can find us at Academy Art ID on Instagram. And that's again specific to the School of Industrial Design. So uh, if you found this again uh, really compelling, uh, look us up. We'll be posting future events there. Um, some are close to our students only, some are open to the public, like today's. Um, but you know, we'll definitely uh, let you know as uh, as we're posting these uh, upcoming events in our Instagram feed. So let's see here. And I'm also going to put uh, Aaron's as well too. All right, any other questions, guys? Cool, and Antonio. Yep. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna take a minute for any of the students that are hanging back. I'm just gonna continue to keep putting my email here. Um, awesome. For any students that are interested in looking at the university, um, the process is really to talk to admissions. And what we do is we try to have more of a one-on-one -on -one consultative meeting to talk more in detail about what it is that you're looking to do, what career paths. I'm sure some of you out there are looking for undergraduate degrees, some maybe a master's program. So we wanna be able to explain to you the differences and make recommendations. Um, we also are happy to take a look at portfolio work. So if you do have any experience, uh, we, we love and encourage you to submit anything that you may have. We'd love to take a look at it to try to give you pointers on what courses might make the most sense for you, what path might make the most sense for you. So if you'd like to talk just one-on-one, -on -one, and try to set up some time to go over those options. Uh, please send me an email. I'd love to connect with you in any way, shape, or form. If there's any students out there that are still on and you're still in high school, I would encourage you if you're exploring options for college, uh, check out our pre-college art experience program. It's totally free. You don't have to pay to apply. You don't even have to pay for the classes. 
It's a great way to explore different art and design classes and build some skills early before you start college. Um, you actually do earn scholarship dollars for taking those courses with us as well. So really cool thing to check out. I just put the link there. And then uh, the last thing I'm gonna do is for anybody that's interested in applying to the university, whether it be an undergraduate student, graduate, international student, there's a link to the application. If you feel like you're ready to do an application to the university, go ahead and knock that out. If not, send me an email so we can talk and set up that one-on-one. -on -one. We're more than happy to go through that process of just trying to explore together before we do anything. So uh, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm more than happy to get back to you and I'll be uh, looking forward to catching up with anybody that was here tonight. So I hope to see some of you again next Tuesday. Thanks again, Hector, for hosting us tonight. Um, really appreciate your time. And uh, Aaron, again, I mean, you're killing it. It's starting to look really good here. Um, so thanks again for, for coming out today and uh, again, showcasing your, your process and your approach and exposing us to some of your uh, some of your endeavors uh, that you had again, professionally and creatively here. So um, it's really been a pleasure, um, you know, to watch your growth and, uh, and also again, just to, to see your approach to this, um, super inspirational. And uh, one last thing I'd like to note as well, um, for the art experience, you know, um, we actually are going to have our transportation and motorcycle or, or transportation design uh, art experience course, which covers um, car design and motorcycle design um, for the spring of 2021. So those of you students that are in high school and, and kind of want to dig a little bit further into this world, I definitely would encourage you guys to, to apply and, and Hector provided those links there in the chat for you guys. Um, so Aaron, yeah, um, if, if you can maybe tell us a little bit more here, just uh, just to wrap things up. And uh, I know you're probably gonna take the time to to get it to to the next level for Instagram, right? You gotta do it again. Um, I'll try to finish that right. before we uh, put it down. But no, thank you guys so much for, for having me. This was, uh, it was a ton of fun. Uh, I hope it was uh, informative, at least for uh, a bunch of people who are considering uh, you know, this career path. It's definitely something that I, I really enjoy. Um, what I did here before I finish is I just took um, some paths, which are just the pen tool, um, just to kind of clean stuff up so that I don't have to turn um, you know, the line work back on. Uh, it's just a really quick way to kind of show like, okay, this is how simple it is. Um, and this is really like enough for me to know that, um, you know, okay, this, I can go in and I can, I can take this in the car and I can, I can start, you know, building it. And that's really what I'm looking for. So um, again, yeah, it's, it's just whatever, whatever works best for your workflow. Um, and I was coming to put a little, a few little dark spots down here and then up here just to kind of separate where the, the seat is. Oops, Get the wrong tool selected. Just kind of show Show the break there. And then the last thing generally what I'll do is I'll take um, the whole sketch um, and I'll make a copy of everything and I'll merge it. And then if I want to like stretch it, you know, make it a little bit more wide, or if I want to, um, you know, make it a little bit bigger on the page to make everything fit better. Um, and then the, the very last thing I do is I usually go up to filter again and I go to noise and I just add a little bit of noise, um, not that much, just to make it feel, just give it a little bit of a just very slight texture so that things feel real. They feel like fabric. Um, they feel like it might be like, you know, plastic or something with a little bit of flake in it. Um, and then the very last thing I'll probably do is just come in here and put a little bit of a line to show where my seat ends and the rest of the tub begins. And then I'm just gonna take my brush tool um, with a sketching brush and I'm gonna turn it white, I'll make a new layer. And uh, I'm just gonna make the brush a little bit bigger and just strike along that path. Oops, that was too, too big. About that size, I'll just strike there and then I'll kind of erase away. I wanna do that and I'll do one more um, just along the back to kind of show kind of where the, the edge of the seat would be. 
just like I do this and kind of sh shorten that out a little bit so that you can see the highlight. And to me, I mean, yeah, I could, the, th the, th the thing is you can spend, you know, as much time as you want on a sketch. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, when you're, when you're happy with it, when you're finished with it and when you want um, to, you know, to be done with it. So this is where probably where I would, uh, where I would stop generally. And, um, you know, the only thing you got to do now is just, um, you know, finish it, put a little, um, you know, clean up the edge a little bit and then, uh, put your name on it and you're, uh, you're a designer. That's all it <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, yeah. Thanks guys for, for having me. This was super fun. Uh, it's the first time I've done something like this, but yeah, nice. it's, been, it's been a, it's been a real, uh, real pleasure. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for everything. That Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. And, and also some of the behind the scenes people, the online team, uh, marketing, sure. uh, the whole squad that's out there to put these on. Thank you guys. Antonio, as always, thank you for, uh, always helping to find some of the best and, and bring it. So, and Hey, Aaron, great stuff, man. Your drawings are so impressive and it's so cool to even just watch live. Um, I would tell any students that if they're still out there right now watching, like it's, it's a long journey to get that skill set. I think a lot of people are looking and I know Antonio was talking a lot about the software and the tools and maybe even, I would just tell anybody, don't take those shortcuts, like build this brick by brick, put in the labor. Um, that's how you become a professional. So 100%. That's oh, yeah. it. all right, you guys. Well, good night, everybody. Be safe, and hopefully, we'll see some uh, some of you guys back next week. But uh, be safe, Aaron. Good to meet you, bud, and uh, have a good night, Antonio. All right, Take you care. too. Good Take guys. care. Thanks to the whole team. Uh, Aaron, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to do it. Thanks again. All right, you guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye.